Hi learners, my name is Leah Mofukeng, your economics teacher for today. Today's lesson is going to be based on term two topic of microeconomics. And the microeconomics we're going to only focus today on the topic of perfect market, or you can also call it perfect competition. Under perfect competition, what is that that exactly we're going to focus on? We are going to focus on the following. Number one, we're going to look at a market and a market structure. Then we will look at the characteristics which determine a market structure. Then we will look at a perfect competition as a market structure and again on the concept that we're going to use today in this particular lesson. So we're also going to look at practical examples which exist in the econo economy which relate to perfect competition. We will also focus on the characteristics of a perfect competition. And we will also look at the industry and the individual business. So we will also use the graphs to explain how we derived the demand curve for the individual business. And then lastly, we will also focus on constructing a revenue table to show that in a perfect competition, demand is equals to price, is also equals to average revenue, and that is also equals to marginal revenue. So we also need to look at different ways to say what is a market and what is a market structure. In grade 10, you learned that a market is any place whereby buyers and sellers can meet in order to exchange goods and services. But with the latest technology, a market cannot be restricted to only a place whereby buyers and sellers meet in order to exchange goods and services. A market can also be a mechanism which facilitates exchange of goods and services. Like we Nowadays, we have online banking. We also have online shopping, where you can enjoy banking while seated at home using your internet on your computer. So let us look at what a market structure is. So before we can go, you also need to focus on the following resources. You need a calculator. Why do you need a calculator? So that with the calculator, we're going to calculate revenue. You also need writing pads so that as I'm presenting, you can also take notes. You also need a pen for taking notes, but why do you need a pencil and a ruler? It is because you are going to practice how to draw graphs, and you're also going to use the ruler for drawing of the graphs. So you will need any approved caps textbook. And lastly, you will also need mind the gap. As I've explained to you that a market is an institution or mechanism where that brings together buyers and sellers of goods. But I also highlighted that we can also use online banking, we can also use online shopping. So what exactly is a market structure? What makes it to look different from a market? A market structure refers to the main characteristics of the market in which individual businesses sell their products and includes their production cost. So simply, a market structure means how a market is organized. So before we can go straight to a perfect competition as a market structure, we need to look at these main characteristics of the market structure, which shows how a market is organized. Number one, we have the number of businesses. So what does number of businesses mean? It simply means that in a market structure, you can find many sellers, or you can find few sellers, or you can even find one single seller. Number two, entry and exit from the market. As you study a market structure, one need to look as to whether is it easy to enter that particular market or is it difficult to enter that market? Are there any, are there any restrictions or is there entry blocked? Number three, there is influence over the price. 
So in a market structure as a learner, you need to know as to whether the sellers have control over the prices or the sellers don't have a control. If they have control over the price, we will then say the sellers are price makers. But if the sellers don't have a say in determining the price, then we will say that the sellers are price takers. Let us look at number four. Characteristic number four talks to availability of information. In a market structure, you also need to check as to whether information is available for both buyers and sellers. Are they aware of what is happening in the market condition or is it information incomplete. They're not even aware of what is determining the price, what other factors are also influencing the price. And then number five, it is the nature of the product. The nature of the product in a market structure can vary from being homogeneous to being heterogeneous or products can be homogeneous but be differentiated in certain ways. So let us look at Characteristic number six. Characteristic number six, as you study a market structure, you need to know as to whether there are practical examples in the economy. If I'm talking about perfect competition, does it exist? Where in the economy can one find this type of a market? Number seven, characteristic of demand curve. This characteristic, as you're studying the market structure, you need to know how the demand curve will be sloping for each and every market structure. Is it a straight horizontal line? Is it sloping downward? And how does it relate with the price that is charged? Characteristic number eight, there is a period when you need to know the type of profit that is earned by the business. Whether the business is making economic profit, whether the business is making economic loss, as to whether the business is making normal profit. This will depend as to whether the period is in the short run or the period is in the long run. So studying of market structure, you need to know the type of profit that is earned by the market structure. Number nine, you also need to know as to whether decision making of the sellers, how does it affect the price of that particular market? When we look at characteristic number 10, which is collusion, you also need to learn as you study different types of market structure to check as to whether is it possible for sellers to come together and agree on the price that should be charged in order that they can limit competition and have market power so that the price can go up and the quantity sold will be less. So such things need to be checked as to whether they exist in each of the market structure or they don't exist. Characteristic number 11, which is productive or technical efficiency. You also need to look as to whether is the are the sellers able to produce goods at the lowest cost possible? Are they able to produce goods of best quality? Then lastly, number 12, that is the last characteristic which you can use to study different market structures. It is allocative efficiency. With allocative efficiency, that's when you need to know as to whether the businesses will be able to produce goods which are needed by the consumers at the right quantity. You will also need to know as to whether the production mix meets or matches the needs of the consumers. Just like when I started the lesson, I mentioned that today's lesson will focus on perfect competition. Perfect competition is not the only market structure that we have. We have four market structures, namely perfect competition, which you can call perfect market. We also have monopoly, we also have oligopoly, we also have monopolistic competition. But today, I have I highlighted perfect competition because this is what we're going to focus on.
a hint for you. Perfect competition on the list, you saw that it is number one. It is not number one because it is perfect. It is number one because we're going to use it as a measure or as a yardstick to compare it with other market structures. The examiner can ask you a question to compare all the four market structures. Or the examiner can again ask you to compare a perfect competition with a monopoly, to compare a perfect market with monopolistic competition, to compare a perfect market with an oligopoly. But for now, you cannot be able to do the comparison. Why? Because you need to learn about all the four market structures. You need to learn about perfect competition, monopolistic competition, oligopoly, and monopoly. Then as you finish studying the four, then you can be able to compare. What exactly is a perfect market or a perfect competition? Take note that the word perfect competition and perfect market will be used interchangeably as they mean one and the same thing. A perfect competition is that type of a market structure where there are many participants. What do we mean by saying that there are many participants? We mean that there are many sellers and buyers, but there is something that you need to take note. These buyers and sellers, no one can influence the price. None of them can influence or manipulate the price so that the price can go up or the price can go down. That is what makes a perfect competition differ from the other three market structure. So like I've alluded with the last bullet here that a perfect competition gives us a benchmark or a measure against which we can compare other market structures, namely monopoly and oligopoly and monopolistic competition. There are concepts that I'll be using in this lesson. I want you to take note of this concepts because they're going to be useful and they will add meaning to today's lesson. Don't stress, for now I will highlight the concepts, but during the presentation, you will learn more about how to explain them and use them in the content. The first one is average revenue. You need to know that what does the term collusion mean? You need to know what the, does the term homogeneous product mean. Other concepts that you need to learn about is the term industry and the term market. The term market structure, the term marginal revenue, also you need to master these concepts. You need to know what a perfect market is, and I've already explained that, and you need to know what a pr price taker is. What do we mean when we say a seller is a price taker? You also need to know what does the term total revenue mean, what does the term equilibrium point mean, and what does the term market price mean? I've mentioned that you need to know the concept. You need to master the concept. Why? These concepts are beneficial in the following manner. It will help you in answering section A questions. In section A, that is where you'll find that for question 1.1, you are given multiple choice question. And the concepts are described and you are given about four concepts to choose the correct one. If you don't know your concept well, you won't be able to select the alternative that is correct. Again, in question number 1.2, where you will find that you are given matching items. You have to match the concepts in column A with the concept, with the descriptions in column B. So if you are given a list of concepts and a list of descriptions for you to match, this knowledge of concept will benefit you in answering such questions. And then lastly, number question 1.3. 
It's where you are given only the definitions or the descriptions. Yours is to identify those uh, descriptions by providing the right concepts. And you are not allowed to give abbreviations here. You give us a term. Abbreviations are not allowed. For example, if your answer is average revenue, you cannot write AR. You need to write average revenue in full. Secondly, knowledge of concepts will assist you when you're answering data response questions. Data response questions are these questions that we find in section B, whereby you can be given a cartoon, an extract, or a table. Then one of the questions might be that briefly describe the term economic profit, briefly describe the term perfect market, briefly describe the term equilibrium point. So if you don't know your terms, you will lose marks. Lastly, the concept will assist you when writing your essay type question in section C. You will find that it will boost your vocabulary, it will assist you even to build your main part of the body into headings and subheadings. Even your introduction, you will see when I address the skills for essay writing, you will see that mostly in the introduction of economics essay, we do describe or define the concept in the essay. When looking at characteristics of market structure, I've mentioned one characteristic as an example to say you need, as you are studying market structures, to be able to relate to them practically. As I mentioned that, a perfect market is a market where there are many buyers and sellers who cannot influence the price. Where exactly can we find these particular uh, uh, examples of the perfect competition? Does a market like this exist where you don't have an influence, but you are the owner of the business, but you don't have an influence? So yes, examples do exist, but take note that the perfect competition is a market which is rare. It is so rare that even the examples are so less. They do sometimes match the characteristics of a perfect market. So we have a forex exchange market where traders exchange currencies. In term one, you learned about the forex market whereby our South African Reserve Bank is currently using what? A free floating exchange rate system. So whereby the value of the rent, when it comes to exchanging rents with dollars, exchanging rents with other currencies, in South Africa, only the market forces of demand and supply determine the, 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 the exchange rate. So none of the officials at the Reserve Bank can influence or manipulate how the rate should be traded or how it should function. None of them can use devaluation or revaluation to influence how it works. Another example, we have agricultural market or fresh produce market. With fresh produce market, we can relate to products which are similar, such as carrots, potatoes, grains, etc., which are all generic. Another example is the share market or the stock exchange market. In South Africa, the practical example that we can relate to is the Johannesburg Security Exchange. Lastly, we have the international commodity market, whereby we have the market for gold and the market for oil. This is the business of the day, characteristics of perfect competition. If you master these characteristics, then it will be easier for you to move to monopoly, monopolist competition, and oligopoly. What I'm going to do now, I want to list these characteristics. When I list, it means that I'm not going to go in detail. So the examiner can ask you to list any two characteristics of a perfect competition or to name any two of these characteristics. Let me quickly name the characteristics. Number one, products must be homogeneous. 
or identical. There should be many buyers and sellers. There is no preferential treatment, there is no discrimination, and there is no collusion. There is efficient transport and efficient communication in this market structure. Free availability of market information, meaning that information is complete. There is free access to and from the market, or we can say there is free entry or exit. The factors of production are completely mobile, and the market is unregulated. What I've done, I've just listed the characteristics. The next step is to examine the characteristics. If you examine, it means that you're going deeper. So we're going to look at each characteristic, explain it deeper. So this might be a possible essay. Remember the comparison. As you compare perfect competition with other market structures, you need the characteristics. So you need to write in full sentence, you need to write in bullets. Let's look deeper into each characteristic. Products must be homogeneous. For you, for just writing that, products must be homogeneous or identical. You will get a simple one mark. You will be awarded one mark. What else do you need to say? In bullet form, you need to explain what you mean when you say that uh, products are homogeneous. In this market, products are homogeneous in the sense that physically they are the same. If we are talking about a tomato market, all tomatoes in this market physically must be the same. The products should also be the same in terms of grade and quality. The products should be the same even when it comes to packaging. Issues like using of the logo, using of the trademark do not exist in a market where there is a perfect competition. So logos will not be used, trademarks will not be used. Why? So that buyers cannot be able to choose the product of one seller above product of another seller. They must just be the same. So you will get two marks for mentioning that all products are identical, the same in all aspects such as great quality appearance and have no trademark. You will be awarded two marks for just saying that. Secondly, when you mention that there's no reason for buyers to prefer product of one seller to the product of another, you will be awarded another two marks. And then for giving us an example of homogeneous products, mentioning agricultural products, you, you even mentioned e.g. tomatoes, then you will get, for an example, you'll get one mark. Even if you can give us 20 examples, you will still get one mark. So there's no use for you to give us lots of examples for one uh, characteristic. So looking at these characteristics, you have already earned yourself one, two, three, four, five, six marks. Okay. So make sure that if you examine, examining is not the same as listing. So listing is only when you just say products must be homogeneous. So when you go deeper, that's how we examine. Let's move to the next characteristic. There should be many buyers and sellers. One mark. Why there must be many buyers and sellers? So that none of them can influence the, the price. So the question is, if they cannot influence the price, who will determine the price? In this particular market, the price is determined by the market forces of demand and supply. Then the sellers are just price takers. They take the price from the market or from the industry. Don't stress, later I will show you graphically how the price is taken from the industry. So another point that you need to remember with this characteristic is that each seller's market share is so small that he or she cannot even influence the prices. So you will get your two marks for each bullet, no single producer or buyer can influence the price, 
When there are many sellers of a certain product, the share of each individual seller is so small, you'll get your two market, two max. Sellers are price takers, they accept the prevailing market price, two max. If they increase the price above the market price, they will lose customers. The last bullet, I will also share with it with you graphically to say that if the market price of a packet of tomatoes is 10 rent, but one seller decides to sell it at 20 rent, what is going to happen? He will lose customers. So sellers don't have a say as far as market price is concerned. They just accept it. The next characteristic. Next characteristic is efficient transport and communication, which is one mark. Efficient transport ensures that products are made available everywhere. Transport plays an important role in this market. Why? So that if products are available everywhere, the market of demand and supply will be able to be effective. We don't want to see a situation whereby goods are easily transported to Houghton province and the market forces of demand and the supply are applied. But in the Eastern Cape, there is a delay in delivery there is, which causes a shortage of tomatoes in the Eastern Cape. What is going to happen is that the price that will be charged at Eastern Cape will be a price that is higher than the market price because of the shortage in the products. So in this way, changes in demand and supply in one part of the market will influence the price in the entire market. So what we're saying is that if goods are available, transported to all sectors of the economy, then we will be able to apply demand and su supply to determine the price. So that we don't have areas of the economy whereby prices of tomatoes are high, and then in certain areas, prices are less. Only the market price should prevail. So lastly, don't forget that you, you have just earned yourself two marks, and then there must be efficient communication which keeps buyers and sellers informed about the market condition. So with technology today, it is easy because of the internet, because of radio, because of TV, because of catalogs. Sellers and buyers are able to know what is happening in the market. I will link the last bullet with the next characteristic. There must be information. Information should be complete. All buyers and sellers must be fully aware of what is happening in any part of the market. So they need to have exactly the same knowledge about the products, their quality, their prices, and other factors that can influence the price of the products. I've already mentioned that because of technology, it is easy to get the information. So each sentence, full sentence, not a half sentence, each full sentence, you will be awarded full two marks. Let's move to another characteristic. The other characteristic is free access to and from the market. Usually we will say that entry is easy, Exit is easy. What does this again mean? It simply means that if I'm a tomato farmer and I'm enjoying economic profits and you're observing me and nothing will stop you to enter the, the tomato market and establish the same business as mine so that you can also enjoy e uh, the economic profit. So there are no restrictions to entry. Even when you feel that it is no longer profitable in the market, nothing prevents you from leaving. That is why we are saying it's easy to enter the market and it's also easy to leave. Why? There are no restrictions like too much capital is needed to establish the business. There are no restrictions like you need a license or a permit to, 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 to start the business. Sellers in the industry do not have technological advances. The same technology that they have is 
everyone else have the same technology. So as a result, that is what makes it easier to enter this particular market because there are no restrictions. So for mentioning that this means that, okay, for mentioning that there is free access is your one mark, this means that if an individual business observe another business making a large profit, can open a similar business, that is a two mark. Businesses have the freedom to stop production and exit the market, another two marks. Entering and leaving a perfect market is easy as less capital is required. I've mentioned that, another two marks. There are no barriers to entry such as, you know, licensing, patent rights, technological advances, or sole rights to a natural resource. You will get your two full Marks. Do you see how easily one can get marks in economics? You give us a heading, you explain in bullets, you get your two marks, two marks for each full explanation. Let's move to the next characteristic. There is no preferential treatment. There is no discrimination. There is no collusion. How? Because prices are determined by the market forces of Demand and supply. Sellers cannot come together and agree that we're going to limit output, we're forcing the price to go up. No. Because the price which the sellers are selling is the same from the market price, it means that there is no price discrimination. Meaning that if buyer A comes to my business to buy a packet of tomato, if the market price is 10 rand, I will sell it for 10 rand to, to him. If buyer B comes to my business, we'll still pay 10 rent. So there won't be discrimination whereby you find that the next customer will be paying 20 rent for the same packet of tomatoes. No, that is not applicable here. So price discrimination is totally impossible. Collision is totally impossible. So for mentioning all these facts, you will get your two marks. Look at this bullet. It says buyers and sellers base their action solely on their price. Homogeneous products fetch the same price. So there's no way that there will be preferential treatment. So and therefore no preference is shown for buying from or selling to any particular person. So price discrimination is out of question in this particular market structure. Factors of production are completely mobile. One mark. What does this mean? We know that land cannot be mobile. Okay, so with this characteristic, we are referring to entrepreneurship. We are referring to labor. We are referring to capital. Meaning that a tomato farmer, if he no longer wants to use his entrepreneurial skills in a tomato farm, he wants to go and explore somewhere, maybe in the forex market, he can feel free to do so, move his skills from this market industry to another, from this uh, farming market to another industry, which is the forex. Labor, it simply means that if I'm working in a farm and I'm no longer interested, I want to go and work somewhere else. It must be easy for me to resign and get a job somewhere. Capital also should be easily accessible by each seller. That is what we mean. And then you will get two marks for just explaining that production factors such as labor, capital, entrepreneurship can move freely from one geographical area to another and from one market to another. The last characteristic is the one which says the market is unregulated. What does it mean? Have you ever seen a market whereby there's no regulation? Yes, this is the market, perfect competition. The government does not regulate. There's no government intervention. There's no government regulation. So what does this mean? This means that the government cannot impose uh, licensing in this market to say, if you enter, you must apply for a license, pay so much for you to be in this market. Or no, you cannot enter the market because you don't have a license. The government cannot use price control, meaning that if 
government feels that the price of tomatoes is too high. Government cannot use uh, price control to reduce the price. No, only demand and supply will affect the price. Government cannot, again, even use the minimum wages, the maximum price, minimum prices. Government cannot even use measures such as quota, restricting how many goods should be sold, how many uh, uh, should be bought. This is not applicable. The use of subsidies to reduce the price does not apply in this particular uh, market structure. That is what you must always remember when we're saying this market structure is not regulated. There are no rules that the government will use in order to, to regulate this market. So there's no government. The government does not interfere. You have noted that one. The government cannot intervene by producing merit goods, providing collective goods by using subsidies, using quota, as I have mentioned. Government cannot use regulations. Please take note of this. Licenses, permits, two marks. So decisions in this particular market are only left to individual sellers and individual buyers. That's the end of the characteristics we're moving to another level. So I hope that if you come across an exam question whereby you are required to examine the characteristics of a perfect competitor, you will be able to write in headings and also explain in paragraphs. Let us look at the meaning of an industry. Remember, I promised you that this concept will be explained throughout the lesson. What is an industry and what is an individual business? How are prices determined in the industry and by the individual businesses? First of all, let me start with the word industry. Industry means a total of individual sellers, who are selling the same products. So if we are having, for example, 1,000 farmers, together they form an industry. But the moment I call them farmer A, it means that farmer A is an individual seller. Farmer B, an individual seller. Farmer C, an individual farmer seller up to YZ, but together, farmer A, B, C, D, E, F, together they form what is an industry, as long as they are selling homogeneous products which are the same. So if it is a tomato industry, it means that each individual seller will be selling tomatoes. Hence, with the last bullet, we're saying that the output of an industry is the sum of the output of its individual seller. Now that you know what an industry is and what an individual seller is, let us look at how prices are determined. Okay. In this market, prices are determined by the industry. So whenever I say industry or market, just know that I mean one and the same thing. The moment I say a firm, an individual business, an individual supplier, an individual seller, an individual producer, I mean the same. So I'll be switching from industry to market. And then the moment I say a firm, you know I'm referring to one single supplier. So in an industry or the market, the forces of demand and supply, which you learned about in grade 10, will be the one that will determine the market price. And then what will happen to the individual seller or the firm? Individual seller or the firm will take the price from the market. Now we are approaching the point where I promised you that we don't just take, but graphically, you need to see how they take. So let's go back to our slide. I've alluded to point number one that prices are determined by supply and de 
Monday. And that individual businesses are price takers and they sell goods at the market price. So this is the price that they take from the industry. So like I've mentioned, if I say individual business, individual seller, individual supplier, individual producer, or a firm, I mean one and the same thing. Are you familiar with this particular graph? Are you familiar with this graph? This graph, you learned about it in grade 10. This is grade 10 content. Let me quickly take you back to grade 10. When you draw a graph, you were taught that there must be a title for the graph, price determination in the industry. So this graph will represent an industry. This quantity will represent the total quantity by all the sellers in that market. This price will be the one that we call market price. Okay, but first let's look at how the graph should be drawn. You start with the title. I've already given it a title to say it's price determination in the industry. What is the next step? The next step is to draw your vertical axis. The second step will be to draw your horizontal axis. After drawing your vertical axis and connecting it with your horizontal axis, what will be the next step? The next step will be to label your axis. This always is the price axis even the cost exists. And then we always know that this will always represent the quantity. Now that you know that this is your price exists, this is your quantity exists, you need to label on the graph. So labeling of the graph, we're referring to when you mention that this is PO and when you mention that this is QO. So where you do not have a scale, then you will ensure that you draw your graph correctly. But let me show you that. Let's say you have a schedule for demand curve and schedule for supply. What are you going to do? You must label the starting point. Let's say this point is your one. This point is your one, and then this is your two rent, and where it is PO, it is your three rent, then your four rent upwards. Then with the quantity, let's say this point is your 100, starting from zero, your 100. This point is your 300, 400. Maybe the quantity here where it's Q0, it's your 500. Then you will use the applicable scale that appears on the schedule then you will plot your demand curve according to the schedule. We always know that demand curve slopes downward. It slopes downward from top left to bottom right. What does this represent? It says that where the price is high, even at a price of four rand, for example, less goods will be bought. But if the price drops maybe to one rent, quantity which we'll bought will be more. We buy more at lower prices. So it has, the demand curve has a negative gradient, but the supply curve slopes upward. It shows a positive gradient, why? It means that if the price is less, sellers will be willing to sell less. But if the price is high, they will sell more. So the point where demand and supply meet, we will call it the equilibrium point. So take note that it is important to label your curves. This curve, you can label it D or DD. The supply curve, you can label it S or SS. But the point where the two curves meet, please label it equilibrium. 
So what is equilibrium point? Equilibrium point is a point where demand and supply meet. At this point, this Q0 or 500 will be the quantity which the sellers are willing to sell and the buyers are willing to buy. The most important thing will be the price, PO or price of three rent. Always when we're talking about the market price, we are referring to the price where demand and supply are equal. So if a packet of uh, tomatoes is sold for three rent in the market, then it means that each seller should also take this price of three rent and ch charge it to their consumers. So their consumers will buy a packet for three rent. So this is what we, we say when we say they're taking the price. Let's continue. This is how the graph will look like. The examiner can ask you to explain price formation in a perfect market with the use of graphs. So always when you draw your graphs, you make sure that you start with the graph for the industry. I said that this graph is for the industry or you can call it a graph for the market. Okay, always make sure that on your left, you start with the graph for the industry. And then on your right, then it will be the graph for the individual producer. Together, all these individual producers, together, this let's say is A, this is pharma B, pharma C, D, etc. Each and every one of them will have a graph which looks like this, but together, in the industry or the market, the graph which represent the tomato industry or the tomato market will look like this. So I've shown you how to draw the demand curve, how to draw the supply curve. I even mentioned that, for example, let's say P3 is a three rand for a packet of tomatoes. And I even used the 500 as an example of the quantity that will be sold and that will be bought. So because this is the price, why? It is the price which we find where? On the equilibrium point. How do individual sellers take the price? That's how you're going to use your pencil. Remember, one of the resources that I said you must have is a pencil. That is when you will draw a dotted line straight up to here, and then you stop. You draw the vertical, Exist, you draw the horizontal axis, you label it quantity, you label it price. Okay, then you take the price of three rent. This will be our three rent. You take this price and draw a straight line which will represent the demand curve for the in for the individual producer. Remember, I said that you can call him a firm, a firm, or a supplier. There's two things that I want you to take note of. The demand curve for the industry slopes downwards from top left to bottom right, which means that as the price goes up, less will be bought, as the bought and sold, and then as the price goes down, more will be bought. So always remember that the demand curve for the industry is downward sloping, but the demand curve for the individual supplier or the firm is a straight horizontal line. So can you see how the price of three rent was taken by the individual supplier? All in all, this simply means that the market forces, charges a price of three rent. As an individual firm, you don't have a choice but to also charge the same price. This is summarized in this slide. The demand curve for the industry is downward sloping from top left to bottom right. The price determined by the industry or the market is P1. Let us go back and see. 
This is our P1, this is our P1. The individual seller will take the price from the industry, which is P1. That is why we call him or her, we call him a price taker. So the demand curve for the individual business is not down sloping, but it is a straight horizontal curve at the market price of P1. Another thing, the demand curve of the individual business is completely elastic. That's grade 11 information. It's completely elastic. What do we mean by that? There will be a demand as long as the business charges the market price. And again, what makes the demand curve to be completely elastic? It is because the products which are sold in this market are homogeneous and are close substitute of what other sellers are selling. Hence, the demand curve will be elastic. This horizontal line at the market price, it is the demand curve. I want you to note, let's go back to the graph. This horizontal line, it is the demand curve. It is not only the demand curve, it is also the average revenue, and it is also the marginal revenue. Let's go back to our graph. As you can see at this graph, I've already explained that this is horizontal. The price is the same as the demand curve, but it is also the same as average revenue, and it's also the same as marginal revenue. Where you are seated, you're asking yourself, what is average revenue? What is marginal revenue? This is your grade 11 content. We will go back to it. So in finishing to explain the, how the price is determined here, I want you to be aware that at the price of three rent or P1, one packet of tomato can be sold. At the same price of three rent, the second, packet of tomatoes can be sold. At the same price of three rand, the third packet of tomatoes will be sold. At the price of four rand, the same price of three rand will be charged and the fourth quantity will be sold. So it doesn't matter how many quantities you are selling, but the price will remain the same throughout, hence this straight line. Let's go and look at the revenue concepts. Remember at the beginning of the lessons, I showed you different concepts. So one of the concepts that you're going to learn about today is the total revenue. It is the average revenue. It is the marginal revenue. What is total revenue? We use the abbreviation TR for total revenue. It is the total income which the business receives from selling its product. Total revenue can be calculated on a daily basis. It can be calculated weekly. It can be calculated monthly or yearly. So if you want to know how much revenue did I receive for selling maybe about 500 uh, 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 boxes of tomato. What do you need to know? You need to know the formula. How do you calculate your total revenue? Then you will say TR equals to P times Q. What does P represent? P represent the price. And then what does Q represent? It represent quantity. So you need to use the price and multiply it by the amount of boxes which were sold so that you can be able to know how much you received from selling all your products or a certain amount of your products. Then again, what is average revenue? Average revenue, it is the amount that is earned by the firm for every unit of output sold. If you sell quantity one, which is a box of tomato, you need to know how much revenue it brings. You sell quantity two, you need to know how much 
revenue, each quantity brings to the business. How are you going to be able to do that? You're going to say average revenue equals to total revenue divided by the quantity. Then lastly, you need to know what the term marginal revenue mean. Marginal revenue means that extra. In fact, the word marginal means extra. So that extra income that you receive for selling an extra product or for selling an additional product, that will be your marginal revenue. So the next step is that these are the explanations of the concept and the formula to calculate. How do we calculate marginal revenue? When we calculate marginal revenue, we look at the change, the change in total revenue and divide it with the change in quantity. So let us use this information to draw a revenue schedule and to also calculate revenue and also plot the graphs. So first of all, we're going to construct a revenue table. This revenue table, what do we want to prove? We want to prove that in a perfect competition, especially for each seller, for each individual producer, the demand curve will always be equal to the price. The price will always be equal to the average revenue. The average revenue will always be equal to the marginal revenue. This is only applicable to a perfect competition or a perfect market. This is what makes this market to be different from other markets. The price is equal to average revenue, the price is equal to marginal revenue, the price is the same as the demand curve. Okay, I've used an example here. We have five columns here. This is what we call a revenue table. If you don't want to call it a revenue table, you will call it a revenue schedule. So we have quantities which can be produced and sold. Quantities range from zero, one, two, three, four, five, up to number six. Then the price, I've been using tomatoes, I love tomatoes, I've been using tomatoes as an example. And if the packet is five rent, this simply means that for the first packet, the price will still be five rent. For second packet, price will be five rent. For the third packet, price will be five rent. Up until the last one, the price will remain the same. That is what we are observing. Using the formula that I gave you, we said that total revenue equals to price multiplied by quantity. Let's do it practically so. So where we have produced nothing, we have produced zero, but the price is five rand, we will say five. We are aware that we, we didn't produce, but we will still say five multiplied by zero. It will give us what? Anything you multiply by zero, it will give you zero. There's no revenue. There's no total revenue because we simply did not sell anything. But we sold the first packet of tomato. Then we will say five multiply by one. It is five. We move to the second quantity. Five multiply by two. It is 10. We move to the third quantity. Then we say five multiplied by three, it is 15. Then we move to the fourth packet of tomatoes. Five multiplied by four, it's a 20. When we move to the fifth packet of tomatoes that we are selling, we'll say five times five, it's a 20. Five, and then with the last unit, which is unit number six, five times six will equal to a 30. What do you observe by just looking at the total revenue? What is the trend here? The trend is that 
as we are selling less, the total revenue is less. But the more we are selling, total revenue will increase with quantity sold. Then let us move to marginal revenue. How do we calculate it? We said that a change, this little triangle, will represent a change. Okay, it will be a change in total revenue. Divide by a change in quantity. Divide by a change in quantity. So, do you still remember what marginal revenue is? It is that extra income that we receive when we have sold an extra product. So, we, there's nothing extra that was sold here. So, we will move to quantity one. The change in total revenue. Our total revenue was five with the first packet of tomatoes. What are you going to look at? You're going for you to derive the change. You look at your new total revenue. You subtract it with your previous revenue. Then you'll get the change in total revenue. So five minus zero equals to five. So meaning that the change in total revenue here is five. Then we need to get the change in quantity for the first product. One minus the previous quantity is one. So if you say five, min five divided by one, your marginal revenue will be five. Marginal revenue, the same as the price. Then we move to the second product, packet of tomatoes. How do we calculate the marginal revenue? We will say the change in total revenue, which is 10 minus five, which is still five. Two minus one, which is one. You divide it five by one, you still get five. The revenue is five rent, and the price is still five rent. Moving to the third one, 15 minus 10, it's Five, sorry, 15 minus 10, it's five. Three minus two, it's one. Five divided by one is five. The same thing will happen with the remaining calculations for quantity four. 20 minus 15 is five. Four minus three is one. Five divided by one is still five. For the fifth quantity, 25 minus 20, it's five. 5 minus 4 is 1. 5 divided by 1 is 5. 30 for the sixth quantity packet of tomatoes. 30 minus 25 is 5. 6 minus 5 is 1. Then 5 divided by 1 is 5. Let's stop here and pause. Do you notice that for each quantity, the price is 5 rent and the marginal revenue is also five rent from the first packet of tomato to the sixth packet of tomatoes. So let's move to the next column, the column for average revenue. Average revenue, we need to know how much revenue do we receive for each unit that we are selling. Okay, we sold nothing here. We leave it as blank as it, it, it is. But with the first packet of tomato, remember the formula here. The formula here is AR should be equals to total revenue divided by quantity. So for the first packet of tomato, our total revenue is five. Our quantity is one. Five divided by one, gives you five. For the second packet of tomatoes, total revenue is 10. 10 divided by two still gives you five. For the third packet of tomatoes, uh, we say 15 divided by three, it still gives you five. For the fourth packet of tomato, 
you look at your total revenue is 20. 20 divided by four, still it's five. For the fifth one, 25 divided by five gives you five rent. And lastly with the sixth uh, quantity, 30 divided by six is still five. By merely observing, you will see that it is indeed the truth that the price in a perfect competition will be the same as the average revenue and it will be the same as the marginal revenue. Only the total revenue will go up as we are selling more and more. So your graph will neatly, your schedule will neatly look like this. So, so far we have proven that our price is equal to our demand curve. It's also equals to, AR is also equals to MR. Then what is the next step? We're going to use the above revenue table to derive the demand curve for an individual business. Which schedule are we going to use? We are going to use this particular schedule. So drawing of the graph is going to be easier because we know that if the price is the same as the average revenue and is the same as the marginal revenue, our graph will just be a straight horizontal line. So the graph will look like this. So first, when you draw a graph, I said to you, you must do what? There are marks for all the steps that I mentioned. You need to give it a title. So the title here will be in the V dual seller. What else did I say? It can be a firm. It can be individual supplier, individual producer, or individual farmer, depending on example. Our X's, are they labeled? Yes, this is the price, and then this should represent, the, bit, the horizontal will represent qua, it will represent quantity. Then, what are we going to do? You go back to your schedule, you will see that the quantity starts from zero up to six. That's how you will plot your graph. From zero, using a scale of one. One, two, three, four, five, six. There are marks for all these things that I've mentioned. So you go back to your schedule, you look at the price, at the average revenue, at the marginal revenue, everything is five rand, price five rand, marginal revenue five rand, average revenue five rand. Then you go back to construct your, your, your table. Even if you can have one rent here, doesn't matter, two rent above five, you have six, seven, it doesn't matter. But what is important is that you have observed that the price is five rand, fine. So at five rand, your demand curve will be horizontal, the marginal revenue will be five rent, and your average revenue will be five rent. I'm going to ask you a question. What if there is a naughty seller who's saying, I cannot sell a packet of tomatoes for five rent? I'm not going to make be able to make profit. Let me sell it for 10 rent above the market price. Five rent is our market price. We took it from the industry. What is going to happen? We know that in this market there is perfect information. We know how much the price is. We know that all these many sellers are, are selling the packet for five rent. Definitely, we won't buy from a seller which is charging a higher price than the market price. The seller will lose revenue. The seller will not even make profit, will make a loss, and you'll be kicked out of the market. But let's say another naughty farmer again says, no, I just want to sell a packet for one rent. There's perfect information here. We will definitely go and buy from this seller. Why? The law of demand says that if prices are less, we're buying more. We will buy and we will make sure that we buy more. Sales will increase. His market share will increase, but 
He won't make profit again because he is selling below the market price. Take note of that one. Remember, as I was taking you through this market structure, I did mention that the examiner can ask you to name any two characteristics. Now I am touching on the examples of exam questions that can be asked. You can be asked to name any two of the characteristics of a perfect market. Then for naming any two, you'll get only two marks, one for each. Another thing is that you can be asked to list any two examples of a perfect competition. You can name foreign exchange, agricultural market, fresh produce, wheat market, share market, international commodity, because you were required to name only two, you'll get one mark each and get your two marks. Based on today's lessons, these questions are based on today's lesson. You can be asked this question for two marks. How do businesses determine the price under perfect market? I've explained that clearly. Prices are determined through the market forces of demand and supply. You can be asked a question for two marks again, for two marks. Explain why an individual business cannot influence the market price. Remember I did mention that because there are many buyers and sellers in this market. The, 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 the market share of each seller is so small that it cannot influence the price. Again, the answer can be he cannot influence the market price because market prices are determined through the forces of demand and supply. Let's move to the next question. Explain why in a perfect market the price is equal to the MR for the individual business. It's simply because since the firm gets the same price for every unit it sells, even for the additional revenue the firm receives from selling an extra unit, it will be equal to the price. You saw it when we were plotting that graph to say even if we are selling an extra product because we are selling it at a market price of five rand it will give us five rand. How can the consumer benefit from competition? Obviously we will pay lower prices, sellers will compete by offering better quality services, there will be more choice you can buy from seller A, seller B, seller D. Okay. Explain with the aid of a graph how prices are determined in the perfect market. I've shown you how prices are determined for just drawing the graph for the market or industry or the graph for the firm. For drawing it correctly, you'll get four marks. For drawing for the individual firm, you'll get two marks. That is four, but the question is for eight marks. So explaining the interaction that the individual firm takes a price from the market, that's why he's a price maker, he cannot charge a price that is high. For explaining that in full sentences, then this is how you will end marks. So knowledge of total revenue concepts, Average revenue concepts, marginal revenue concepts can be assessed in section A and section B. Section A in multiple choice matching items where you are also given definitions, you just identify the concept. And then in section B, you can be given a graph depicting revenues, or you can be given a schedule and you can be asked questions to interpret the, the schedule or the graph. Drawing and interpretation of graphs is also important in section B. You saw this question. It refers to this type of a question whereby with the aid of the graph, you can be requested to show us how prices are determined. So if you don't know how to draw marginal revenue, average revenue, you won't be able to draw the demand cap for the individual supplier. Okay. Discuss the nature of the product and the number of sellers as characteristics of a perfect competition. Out of about seven characteristics, you can be asked to discuss only one for eight marks, or you can be asked to discuss 
two. In this example that I've chosen, I've selected nature of product and I've selected number of products. Do you still remember how we were examining them? So it means that you will get four marks for nature of the product and four marks for number of sellers. Meaning that under the nature of product, you will have two facts to discuss. Under the number of sellers, you'll have two facts to discuss. But take note, don't go and only study these characteristics. You must learn all the characteristics and be able to know how to explain deeper. This is what I meant. You'll get a maximum of two marks for just mentioning that pro product must be homogeneous. That's the nature of the product. And there's one thing that I want to highlight. For full sentences, you'll get your two marks. But for providing us with an example, you'll get only one mark. So the same is applicable even when you look at uh, many buyers and sellers as a characteristic. You'll get two marks for each fact. Why is it not advisable for an individual seller? I've said that you heard me when I was demonstrating the graph. You sell at a price above the market price, no one will buy from you. You sell at any price below, we will all come and buy, but you want to maximize profit. Okay, these are questions that you need to know and also motivate by selling that the individual seller cannot charge his or her own price. They must be determined by the market forces of demand and supply. Hence, we said he's a price taker. Examine the characteristics of a perfect competition. I did it with you when we were looking at each and every characteristic. The last part, remember our essay is divided into two. We have the main part and we have the additional part. I have already covered the main part. Remember writing in bullets and for each characteristic, naming it or listing it. There will be one mark for listing and then there will be two marks for every explanation. Then we call this part the main part of the essay. The last one we call it the additional part. But if you look at this max, it says the total is 40. But when you look at this, it gives me 36. So where is the missing four? The two mark will be for introduction, and then the other missing two mark will be for conclusion, then it will be 40. We're not going to go back to each characteristic. I want to take you quickly through this before the end of our lesson. So if you write an introduction, Please go to your question and look at the concept that is in the question. Let's go back. I'm taking you back. Examine characteristics of a perfect competition. Oh, the concept here is perfect competition. So this simply means that in your introduction, you will define or describe what perfect competition is. But be careful. Make sure that anything that you write in your introduction, you don't repeat it in your body. So do not include any part of the question in your introduction. Don't even repeat the question in your introduction. Don't repeat any part of the introduction in the body, meaning that what you are saying in your introduction, mentioning that there are many buyers and sellers and no one can influence the price. You're not going to repeat that in the body because we're going to say this is repetition, we won't allocate you marks. Avoid saying in the introduction, what you are going to discuss in the body. The learners will write that in this uh, essay, I'm going to dis di discuss perfect competition under the characteristics, under how prices are, no, avoid saying that. You can either, the best and simple way is to describe the concept in that particular topic. The main part, we allocate eight marks just for the headings. If you have less headings, we look for subheadings. If you have examples and your headings are not enough, we'll allocate marks for you. Eight marks for heading, subheading, and examples. One mark each. So this means you'll be left, out of 26, you'll be left with 18. And then if the question includes graphs, this 18 mark will be distributed for full explanations and the graphs as well. So avoid using paragraphs because sometimes you'll find that in a paragraph you have explained something in a paragraph 
and when we mark, we award you two marks. But if it is in a point form, you'll find that you can even earn about eight or 10 marks. So please use bullets or points. The additional part, it is where you are required to apply knowledge. The type of questions that will be asked there are of a higher cognitive level, where you can be asked to evaluate something, you can look at something, at the effectiveness of something, you can look at the success of something, you can advise a minister or a CEO, you can recommend strat good strategies, you can suggest, you can analyze, you can argue, you can propose, etc. for 10 marks. Then your conclusion for two marks, it should be of a higher cognitive level. And again, you cannot say in the essay, I have discussed the characteristics, I have discussed how price is determined. No, your con conclusion can be like this. You cannot repeat facts that are already in the introduction or body. You won't get your two marks. You can write any opinion and the conclusion or value judgment on the facts discussed. It can be a contradictory viewpoint with motivation if required. It can be an additional support of information to strengthen the discussion. So your introduction will be two marks, your main part will be 26 marks, and your additional part will be 10 marks, and then your conclusion will be two marks. Together when you add them, they will give you a total of 40 marks. So look at that question, additional part. Why is competition in the marketplace good for the economy? This was not covered anywhere in my lesson. Yours is to go back and think. Mem said that there are many suppliers of a product. So in the economy, if we have many suppliers of electricity, Using electricity as an example. If we have about 1,000 suppliers of electricity and that market, maybe it's a perfect market, how am I going to benefit? That is where we want you to apply knowledge. You won't find the answers in your textbook. You must think outside the box. That's where you can mention, for example, that when firms compete with each other, consumers buy goods and services at a lower price. Lower prices will lead to an increase in aggregate demand. As a result, firms will expand and produce more. Firms will need more workers. So the increase in employment rate, there will be an increase in employment rate. Competition can encourage businesses to conduct a need analysis, which means that we can receive goods at the right quantity, goods that match our needs. Competition can open business opportunities. Competition can lead to higher productivity, meaning that even the GDP of the country will go up. So these are the things that you need to learn to apply knowledge. Competition in the market can lead to invention of new products. Competition result in improved quality of the products and more choice for the consumers. So from where I'm standing, I'm confident that when you approach essay writing in section C, you will be able to go step by step as to how to answer the, to go to the introduction, main part, additional part, and the conclusion. In closing, we must now do a checklist. When I started, I promised you that this is all that is going to be covered. Let us check. A market and a market structure. It was covered. You know the differences between the two. Characteristics which determine a market structure. You can be able to list them and even briefly describe them. Perfect competition as a market structure. You now know what a perfect competition or a perfect market is. Concepts. You can relate to the concepts which were used throughout these lessons. Examples, you now know that the JSE is a closer example of a perfect market. You know that our farmers, they represent a perfect market. You can now examine 
characteristics of a perfect market. You know the difference between the industry and the individual business. You can also use graphs to derive the demand curve for the individual business, that straight horizontal line. And lastly, I know that you can also construct a revenue table and use it to prove that in a perfect market, demand is equal to price, is equal to average revenue, is equal to marginal revenue. And I also showed you how you can respond to certain types of questions if you are sitting for your exams. So this brings us to the end of today's lesson. Bye-bye.